The measles saga of Apollo 13 was a last minute drama that gave the press a story that ran right up until the day before launch. The three astronauts are in good health for their flight to the moon Saturday, but they're a little worried because yesterday they were exposed to a child who had German measles. And so they're being tested now to see if there is any chance of their having measles on the moon. It began on Thursday the 2nd of April 1970 when the Prime crew were attending a briefing session on lunar topography. Also in attendance was Charles Duke, the backup lunar module pilot. And unfortunately for Mattingly, or maybe fortunately, depending on how you view it, by the weekend Duke was confined to his bed, suffering from measles. The Prime crew needed to be tested to see if any of them had a lack of immunity to the disease because if they launched on schedule, the incubation period would see them falling sick in lunar orbit. Blood samples were taken to find out the immunity status of the three men, scheduled to launch to the moon that weekend, and then they waited. The story of the measles scare made the news programs of all the major networks. Would there be a change of crew members? Would the mission be put back again? At the beginning of 1969, Apollo 13 was included in that year's list of missions just in case Apollo 11 and Apollo 12 failed to make the end of the decade deadline. With a successful first landing completed in July, the pace of launches was stretched out and Apollo 13 was rescheduled for the 12th of March 1970. The March date was put back to allow for further training and planning and set for the 11th of April 1970. If any of the crew were not immune to the disease, NASA management had some tough choices to make. A straight crew for crew swap wasn't possible because Duke was ill, but with some estimates of $800,000 for a postponement until the next possible launch date, which was the 9th of May, it could turn out to be the most costly case of measles ever. One Apollo mission had already been cancelled, and with the budget suffering cutbacks, it was a cost that could be avoided by launching on the planned date. If they postponed the mission instead of using the backup system, then it would bring into question why NASA used backups at all if they weren't going to be used when needed. NASA also had to consider what to do with all the personnel put in place around the world to support the mission. With the world's press taking an interest in the pre-launch measles saga, Dr. Charles Chuck Berry stepped into the limelight. Dr. Charles Berry, Director of Medical Operations, said today all three Apollo 13 astronauts were exposed yesterday to German measles. Barry said the crew, James Lovell, Thomas Mattingly, and Fred Hayes, are now in good physical condition, but the results of tests for German measles will not be known until Wednesday. Barry had form for being indiscreet and inserting himself into a story, with Don Isley noting that he had a propensity to mouth all to the press, adding that Barry was in the habit of making public announcements concerning the health and medical problems of astronauts, details of a personal nature that ought to have been kept confidential. Fellow astronaut Michael Collins labelled Berry the biggest blabbermouth in the space programme. Borman had also been angered by Berry in the past and included in his book Countdown part of a letter he had received about an incident that took place before Apollo 11 that called Berry's efforts to be in the public limelight both selfish and dishonest. The letter went on to state that Berry represented NASA in a half-shod, unprofessional, uninformed manner. Every day, the TV news programs updated the story. $375 million mission to the moon, a quarter of a million miles away, remains in peril today by a childhood disease. Walter Cronkite reports from the Kennedy Space Center. The countdown goes on and the weather outlook now is good. But a big question remains about whether Apollo 13 will be launched toward the moon on Saturday. At the beginning of the week, it seemed inconceivable that the mission would not take place because of a measles scare. It seemed equally incredible that with the extended countdown already having begun, any change in the crew would now take place. With the Lovell and Hayes having immunity to the disease, things started looking bad for Mattingly. Apollo 13 is scheduled to leave for the moon on Saturday, but there are complications and there may be a delay because one of the astronauts may be about to have German measles. All three were exposed to it last week and it's highly infectious. Two were found by the doctors to be immune. The third, command module pilot Thomas Mattingly, is not immune. He was obviously bewildered that NASA could even consider dropping him so late in the day for the mission that he had trained so hard for, but there were ominous signs that things were not going to be straightforward. The doctors kept taking his blood and asking if he was okay. 
Swigert was given more time in the simulator and Dr. Berry became vocal on removing Mattingly from the crew. The TV news reports now started to hint at a possible change in the crew, saying that Swigert, who did have immunity, was being considered just days before launch. By Wednesday the 8th of April, Mattingly was discovered to have no immunity to measles. Nurse D. O'Hara had telephoned for the results of the tests and the news from Houston was bad. She said, I was very upset because I knew that he wasn't going to get to fly. Dr. Berry was still pressing for a change and with the launch day fast approaching, a decision had to be made. In reality, it was easier to swap a command module pilot than a lunar module pilot because the lunar surface duo were a team within a team and as such, they had a much closer working relationship. Also, the doctors warned that during the crucial time when they would be performing the lunar orbit rendezvous, the symptoms of measles, which include chills, a fever, swelling of the joints in the hands, and blurred vision, could be affecting Mattingly's performance. As the flight of Apollo 13 neared, Swigert's simulator time had dried up as the prime crew concentrated on getting up to speed. With just two days to go, he was thrown back into the simulators to prove he was capable of doing the job but with his background and ability, there was little doubt that he was up to the challenge. Although Lovell protested that he preferred an ill Mattingly to a healthy Swigert, he had no choice but to go along with the NASA management's decision to put Swigert through a day of testing on the Thursday to see if he could actually step into the command module pilot's role. Lovell's preference was based not on Swigert's ability, but on the months of training that he had completed with Mattingly. Fellow astronaut Gordon Cooper highlighted the importance of not breaking up a crew. Crews worked together extensively, becoming to know each other's moves almost instinctively. Keeping them as a group ensured the best results. Lovell's main concern was how Swigert would perform when the lunar module was separated from the command module. All of the other tasks could be watched over by either Ace or himself when they were in the command module. It is fair to say though that Lovell and Ace were in safe hands. Swigert had been one of the astronauts that actually requested the command module as their chosen spacecraft to specialise in. He had been on the support crews for Apollo 7 and Apollo 11 before being assigned to the backup crew for Apollo 13. During his time as an astronaut, he had been involved in the writing of the malfunction procedures for the command module, so he had an excellent knowledge of them. Cunningham recalled how he and Swigert had worked for months on malfunction procedures. He even went as far as to say, my personal confidence in the safe conclusion of the mission was based on the presence of Jack Swigert. Swigert had also worked on a small team that had included Lovell following the Apollo 1 fire to investigate in-flight emergencies and how to cope with them. He had spent hours extensively testing procedures that contributed to the improvement of the malfunction procedure manual. There was probably no better command module pilot to be aboard for the emergency that occurred in space at 55 hours into the mission of Apollo 13. On Friday the 10th of April, Thomas Paine, NASA's administrator, was at the Florida Space Center to oversee the final word on the decision. With Swigert demonstrating that he could fit into the crew, the decision was made official to move Swigert up from the backup crew to the prime crew. I can report to you that the recommendation of everyone to whom I talked, both in the meeting and in the subsequent meeting with the two astronauts, uh, was a unanimous recommendation that Apollo 13 be launched tomorrow morning. Mattingly had decided that a flight in a T-33 from Patrick Air Force Base would be the best way to take his mind off the looming pronouncement. And it was while he was driving back to the Manned Space Center that he heard a news reporter on the radio announce that he had been dropped from the Apollo 13 crew. With the decision made to send Swigert to the moon instead of Mattingly, there were a few items that needed to be altered. The plaque secured in place between two rungs of the ladder on the front landing leg of the lunar module bore the names Lovell, Mattingly and Hayes. A new plaque had to be quickly prepared that could be fixed in place once the two moonwalkers were out on the surface. Whereas Mattingly described himself as scrawny, Swigert was nearly six foot, which was one and a half inches taller than Mattingly and at 195 pounds, he is reputed to have been the man who weighed the most at launch. For launch, the centre couch would have to be reconfigured for the extra 40 pounds that he weighed. When Swigert inherited Odyssey on the Friday, little did he know that by the following Friday, he would be back on the Earth after a death-defying trip around the far side of the moon. On the 11th of April, 1970, Apollo 13 launched for the moon, 
while Mattingly cut a very dejected figure in mission control, watching his two crewmates, Lovell and Hayes, ride the rocket he had trained so hard to be on. He was bitterly disappointed at the decision. Just days earlier, he had been at the top of the pyramid, one of the team, with the moon within touching distance, and now he had lost his mission, and there were no guarantees that he would get another chance to go to the moon. Once in space, the crew had a code for keeping up to date with any developments with Mattingly's measles scare. The first time they used the code word was at 32 hours into the mission, when Hayes asked, Hey, uh, advance? Uh, Roger, go ahead. Are the uh, flowers blown yet? Uh, gee, I sure haven't seen any. Okay. Mattingly's disappointment, though, was probably alleviated at 55 hours into the mission, when the crew faced the daunting situation of having to use the lunar module as a lifeboat to return home. He was in the control centre to read up instructions to the crew and was on hand to assist in any way that he could to ensure their survival. As the crew prepared for the service module separation, Lovell asked. Houston, Aquarius, over. Go ahead, Aquarius. Are the flowers of bloom in Houston? No, not yet. Still must be winter. Suspicion confirmed. Yeah, I doubt if they'll be blooming even Saturday when you return. I concur. With the teams both on the ground and in space coming together to safely navigate the many twists and turns of the drama, the crew returned to the Earth on the 17th of April. Lovell would say at the post-flight press conference, Jack in particular helped us out in our ensuing odyssey tremendously. Adding later on, if I had to replace Mattingly with anybody, it would have been Jack Swigert. When Lovell returned to Houston, Mattingly was one of the people who greeted him. Lovell jokingly grabbed him by his arms and studied his face and exclaimed, what measles? In the end, although disappointed at not being on the crew, Mattingly had played a vital role in getting them home again. Less than a year later, he would be officially announced as the command module pilot for Apollo 16 on the 3rd of March 1971. Lovell would forever feel cheated by his one and only chance to walk on the moon being lost. Alongside that though, was a realisation that Apollo 13 had nearly killed him. I'm living on borrowed time. I could have been dead back in 1970. And so all this is gravy. Swigert would say of his time on Apollo 13, our teamwork was fantastic. We were one body with three heads and six hands. As tired as we were, there was never a cross word. Everybody meshed. Everybody took his share of the load. He never got assigned to another crew and instead headed into business and eventually into politics. He died of cancer on the 27th of December 1982, just days before he was due to start his congressional term at the US Congress. Fred Hayes was linked to the command of Apollo 19 and to an early space shuttle mission, but in the end both were cancelled and so he never flew in space again. As for Mattingly, he never did come down with the measles.